welcome. I am Lori Mickelson from the Nazarene Church here in Chetwin. Let's praise the Lord as we begin. In the 150 Psalms in this book, the Bible, the words echo and re-echo praise the Lord. The book of Psalms ends with five chapters that are all devoted just to praising God. Psalm 146, verse 1 to 3. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in power pe powerful people. There is no help for you there. The psalm writer starts the psalm with a promise to praise God for the rest of his life. I am quite sure that he realized this would not always be easy because life is not always easy. Consider for a moment the time period. Life has never been easy for a cakewalk for God's people because of their own disobedience in the time between their doing their own thing and repentance. Wars ensued, exiled enemy nations was a common call by God to correct them, and we know from what we read the Old Testament exile was never easy. Verses 4 to 10. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us, and he cares for the orphans and widows, but frustrates the plans of the wicked. The psalmist compares the powerful rulers of the world and God. Powerful people are not good saviors. They can make promises, but they can't always follow through on those promises. We have a God who can and does. He created the world and all that's in it. He keeps his promises and his justice is fair. We see in the la these verses that he does not separate the physical needs from the spiritual needs. He takes care of both. One of the ways that he takes care of these needs is by using us to do what he asks us to do. This psalm also shows God's concern for the foreigners living among us. God is interested in each individual, in each town, in each country. Take a close look at the last part of verse 9 but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. Remember the verse, many who seem to be the greatest now will be the least important then, and those who are considered least important now will be the greatest then, in Matthew 19, verse 30. So as we consider those we turn to and trust on this earth, don't be counting on powerful people to do the job. Their power is limited, God's is not. If God can frustrate the plans of the wicked, and he can, then we can count on him to do just that. Psalm 147, verse 1 to 11. Praise the Lord. How good to, praise, to sing praises to our God. How delightful and how fitting. The Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem and bringing the exiles back to Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great is our Lord, how pow his power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. The Lord supports the humble, but he brings the wicked down into the dust. Sing out your thanks to the Lord. Sing praises to our God with a harp. He covers the heavens with clouds, provides rain for the earth, and makes the grass grow in mountain pastures. He gives food to the wild animals and feels, feeds the young ravens when they cry. He takes no pleasure in the strength of a horse or in human might. No, the Lord's delight is in those who fear him, those who put their hope in his unfailing love. I love this psalm. Have you ever thought about what gives God joy? His greatest joy comes from our worship and our trust. We just read the words that tell us how great he is, how he provides for all of his creation. But I love this psalm because of an incident I had that made me realize just how magnificent he is. It was a cold winter night in Grand Prairie years ago. I was struggling with a homework assignment and whenever I got stuck, I would either go for a walk or I would sit on the step of our house and look up into the sky. 
I looked up to the stars and they were so magnificent that night and suddenly verse 4 and 5 crossed my mind. He counts the stars and calls them by name. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. These are not verses that come to mind easily. Why would they? Yet as I sat there, I had this silly thought. I wonder if God's name for each one of those stars is the same as what we have called them. I could almost picture God speaking them into existence and then giving them their names. Considering that our scientists are still finding new stars all the time, God has known they were there all along. It seems like such a silly thing to think about, but when we look at all that he has created, we can't help but be in awe. And now today, as we read, read these passages, we see how he feeds the wild animals and birds, his hand in the clouds and the rain. We see him hearing the young ravens when they cry because they're hungry. And then we read verse 11. No, the Lord's delight is in those who fear him, those who put their hope in his unfailing love. Verses 12 to 20. Glorify the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates and blessed your children within your walls. He sends peace across your nation and satisfies your hunger with the finest wheat. He sends his orders to the world, how swiftly his word flies. He sends the snow like white wool. He scatters frost upon the ground like ashes. He hurls the hail like stones. Who can stand against his free freezing cold? Then at his command it all melts. He sends his winds and the ice thaws. He has revealed his words to Jacob, his decrees and regulations to Israel. He has not done this for any other nation. They do not know his regulations. The verse that stands out the most in this portion of scripture is verse 15 to 18. He sends his orders to the world. How swiftly his word flies. And what happens? All of nature complies with his orders, not just mankind, but the snow, the hail, the winds, and another season begins. The same power of the word of God that we saw in creation continues to this day and the next. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise him. Praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the last psalm in the book of Psalms. It's very short, but it's packed with praise. God's creation praises him everywhere in every way. This was a hymn of praise and music and song was important. When we read this psalm, we see that we are to praise God in church, praise him in heaven, praise him for his works, praise him for his greatness. What a fabulous way to end the book, instruction of, on how and when to praise God all the time in the midst of difficulty because he is with us, after difficulty because he brought us through it, in times of peace, because those are times of much badly needed rest. Before difficulty, because we need his guidance. Through it all, God is at our side, guiding, encouraging, comforting, and caring. Here in this book are 150 chapters of praise and worship. We learn how we go from praise, worry to worship when we focus on God, when we trust him completely. These Psalms were written at different times by different saints, yet one thing that stabilized their nation was praise and worship. 150 chapters that call us into his throne room. And here we sit. Here we pray for guidance and strength for each new day. Here we sing songs of gratitude, songs of praise. And each week we recommit to worship him all the days of our lives. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for your abundant blessings each day. Thank you for sending your son to save us. Guide us through this coming week and continue to enable us to bring honor and glory to your name. Amen.
Good morning. I'm Carmen Little, a lay leader with the Chetwin Shared Ministry Congregation. Thank you for joining us in this time of worship. We begin our service with our call to worship. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Lord, hear my cry and rescue me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, God who rules wind and water, stand by me. God stands with you in bright sunshine and deepest storm. God gently guides us to safety and peace. Thanks be to God. We continue with our opening prayer. We pray. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace so that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love, joy, and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Keep your focus on Jesus. He is your Savior and your guide. He will never fail you. Rejoice, you are called precious by our Lord. Living God, help us to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do through Christ our Lord. Our gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of Christ for the people of Christ. Lord, save me. After miraculously feeding thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fish, Jesus finally got the chance to be alone. So he sent his disciples out in a boat to go ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He dismissed the crowds and went up immediately on the mountain by himself to pray. By the time evening came, the disciples had made it a long way from the land in their boat. By then, the wind was growing stronger and they were struggling to row against it, but they were getting beaten by the waves. The disciples were exhausted, wind-blown, soaking wet and afraid. They looked out into the storm and saw what appeared to be a man walking toward them, not on the shore, but on the sea. Understandably, they went from being afraid of a storm to being terrified of an unknown apparition. Since men can't normally walk on water, the disciples concluded that it was a ghost and cried out in fear. Jesus immediately speaks to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, instead of waiting for Jesus to get to the boat, Peter decides he needs some proof. Jesus' word wasn't enough for him. So he says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus responded with one word, Come. And with that word, Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Another astonishing miracle. But things had not yet calmed down on the water. The wind was still howling. The white-capped waves were still crashing in on them. And Peter became afraid, and he began to sink. After all Peter had witnessed up to this point, including the feeding of thousands with five loaves of bread and two fish, and now Jesus walking to Peter and the disciples on the sea, and with one word enabling Peter to do the same, Peter still becomes afraid. What else did he want or need from Jesus in order to believe that he truly is the promised Messiah? Well, we can all learn from Peter. You see, Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and instead focused on the wind and the waves and the peril he thought he was in. 
so he began to sink. When we take our eyes off of Jesus and focus on the things of this life, we too can begin to sink into doubt and despair. It's what happens when we take our eyes off of Jesus and focus on the worldly conflicts happening, the civil unrest, problems with the economy, and other global concerns like COVID-19. It's what happens when we take our eyes off of Jesus and focus on our shame over our sin, disappointment over our failures, health issues, rocky relationships, financial problems, and other personal struggles. When we take our eyes off of Jesus and focus on the wind and the waves of living in this world, when we fear the dangers and difficulties in our lives more than we fear, love, and trust in God, we begin to sink. Another thing that we can learn from Peter is that when we begin to sink, instead of thrashing about and trying to save ourselves, like Peter, we need to cry out, Lord, save me. Because the truth is that no matter how hard we try to doggy paddle and tread water to keep ourselves afloat, we can't save ourselves from sinking. When we find ourselves being tossed about by the winds of life, when the treacherous waves of sin are crashing down on us, all we can do is cry out, Lord, save me trusting in his mercy. When Jesus heard Peter's cry, he immediately reached out his hand and took hold of Peter and brought him back to the safety of the boat. When we cry to Jesus in repentance for his forgiveness, life, and salvation, he does the same for us. He immediately reaches out his hand to us and takes hold of us. As Christ reaches out his hand to us and calms our fears, he heals our sadness and brokenness. He removes our doubts and gives us faith and life. Notice that when Peter cried out to Jesus for help, our Lord didn't respond, Okay, Peter, I will save you, but first you better build up your faith and stop doubting. No, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, and this is how it is for us too. Many people think that doubting or struggling with God means that they lack faith, but that's not true. Doubt itself is not sinful or wrong. It can often be the catalyst to new spiritual growth. Struggling with God is a sure sign that we truly have faith. If we never struggle, our faith can never grow. Yes, at times we doubt. At times our faith can be wavering. At times we can find ourselves separated from God, being walloped by the waves of sin and death. But as we cry out, Lord, save me, he does just that. He saves us and gives us everlasting life. Jesus has reached out his hand to you. He has taken hold of you. He will never let you go. The same word that enabled Peter to walk on water is the same word that keeps us in the one true faith for eternity. And it's the same word that leads us to confess, truly, you are the Son of God. Amen. We conclude our service with our prayers for the community. We pray. God of all people, your love and grace sustain the world and all who live in it. When we foolishly set up walls between people, you tear them down and draw us into one family, united in Christ and in compassion. The pandemic has filled so many nations and neighbors with turmoil and fear. So we come before you with prayers for the world you love. Astonishing God, you surprise us. You come to us in unforeseen circumstances and in unexpected people. We give you thanks for all the healers and heroes who have stepped forward during the pandemic to surprise us with kindness and courage. We pray for all who still face upheaval and uncertainty because of COVID-19. Call out leaders with wisdom and imagination to address the fear and change we are facing and fill our hearts with compassion and understanding for the most fearful. God of peace, you reassure us. You remind us not to be afraid when troubles arise. We pray for all people who live in precarious situations not related to the pandemic. Assure them that they are not forgotten. We pray for those who struggle with illness, grief, or depression. May they know your peace and strength. Equip us to reach out in every way we can to embody your love in our words and actions. God of hope, you challenge us. You come to us in the midst of trouble and invite us to stand for justice and work for truth. We pray for all those people crying out for fair treatment, working against racism and discrimination, telling painful stories of their lives. Open our hearts with understanding and motivate us to act for change. We pray for those who resist the stories of injustice and defend inequality. Open their minds to the truths they deny 
and show them new possibilities for relationships that bridge divides. Send your spirit to work in our communities to create mutual respect and new ways to live as neighbours. Faithful God, we place our trust in you and your purposes. Answer our prayers according to your wisdom and will, for we offer them humbly in the name of Jesus. Amen. We go in peace to love and serve our God. Amen. For the past 14 years, Chetwin, BC has been giving artists the chance to carve their dreams. Artists come from all over the world in June and leave us with stunning sculptures. Wood plays a vital role in this town. It's ingrained everywhere you look. I like the hippo, and uh, even though my buddy here uh, carved the moose last year, I bought off of him, I still have to go with the hippo this year. What do you like about it? I just like it's different. It's completely different from what we've seen up here. We don't see a lot of that uh, African type things. You know, it's all eagles, bears, and it's all that kind of stuff. So that's just unique this year, so that's why I'm voting for it this year. What are you carving? Uh, yeah, I carve a uh, hippo and a rhino. Why? Uh, my, my son, favorite animal. <laughs> it's an important, almost confession of, she changed me. And so he wanted to honor her in a way by having her check wind and saying, wow, she's exceptional. She's not someone who just messes around in fancy outfits. She's an educated person to be respected. Oh heck, everybody wants to be in the top three, but just to be here, I'm happy. If I could pull it off and have it look somewhat like a woman, even Gaga, that would be great. As long as it doesn't look like Harmon Munster, I think I've done my job.